Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the Tuesday Tune. My name's Steve. I run Vorsprung Suspension up here in Whistler. Today, we are going to talk a little more about rebound damping, which is a subject that we covered a bit of uh, a couple of weeks ago. We've talked about various aspects of it in the past, uh, but one thing that really stuck out to me was the number of people that were asking for more clarification on how the high and the low speed adjusters uh, work, what should be adjusted when, how they interact, and so forth. So for those of you who haven't already watched, we have done two episodes already of the Tuesday Tune on the interaction between high speed and low speed adjusters in general. Now, more commonly, we see them uh, high and low speed separate adjustments for compression damping rather than rebound. It's more common to have a single rebound adjuster, and that does make life a bit simpler uh, when you only have one rebound adjuster for obvious reasons. There's only one. However, today what we're going to do, do something that we uh, don't typically do, and that is throw a shock on the dyno. Going to put the DHX2 on the dyno, uh, run it through its paces, and show you exactly what it is that the adjustments do. So in that way, we'll be able to get a better feel for exactly what adjustment is working where. And I'll show you why that is. Okay, so we've run tests with the adjusters both maxed out and both of them set to minimum as well. Um, so we've run four tests in total, one with the high speed set to max and the low speed set to max, one with the high speed set to max, low speed to minimum, one with the low speed to maximum, high speed to minimum, and one with both to minimum. So let's have a look at what happens with the high speed set to max. So low speeds here, this is, big pardon, both high and low speed set to maximum. And you notice, uh, this is only the rebound open aspect of the curve. But you notice up here, there's some creeping in the curve. Now, what you'll see there is that the curve is slightly di digressive. So we have a steeper low speed curve than we do a high speed curve. Now that effect, interestingly, disappears a little bit as the frequency of the test increases. And so that basically shows a certain degree of hysteresis um, frequency sensitivity in here. Now this is not a bad thing, but what it does show us is that if we were to only look at this particular curve here, we wouldn't be seeing accurate representation of what happens at low speeds. So that is with both adjusters maxed out. Let's have a look what happens when we back the high speed, uh, sorry, back the low speed all the way off as well, uh, but leave the high speed maxed out. So then we get something that starts off here, and goes. So noticeably, the lower speeds here, uh, we have something that's you know distinctly less damped, like way, way, way less damped. Now this is obviously the extremes of the range as well. So what we can see here though, is that even at the higher speeds, so this is 0.5 meters a second at the shock, which is pretty close to, we're approaching the peak velocities that shock will actually see in rebound there. We can see that just backing off the low speed alone has actually had an enormous effect on the high speed. So let's have a look then at what happens when we have the high speed uh, set to minimum, to the low speed set to maximum. So you can see these curves appearing here, on the top of the screen, just up here. And so what happens is we follow that initial curve that we saw with both adjusters maxed when we're at the very low speeds, but as the high speed rod valve or poppet valve, whatever you want to call it, opens up, then it digresses very sharply. And then we end up with something that has very low uh, degrees of high speed damping. So remember, this one here is high speed at minimum, low speed at maximum. Now let's see what happens when we have the low speed and the high speed set to minimum. So 
It's a bit harder to see the curves at the top there because they're following uh, along here. So as they appear, let's see what they're doing. Now this is quite interesting. So with the high speed backed fully off, this is the total difference that we see in the low speed damping uh, effect on the high speed. Does that make sense? The low speed adjuster effect at high speeds, relatively small up here. We're talking about, what, uh, 100 newtons of force or so. At the very low speeds, the adjuster is still having some effect. But what we're really seeing is that the effect that the low speed adjuster can have is much, much smaller when the high speed adjuster is open than when the high speed adjuster is closed. Because when the adjuster is closed, this to here, so between here and here, all of a sudden is our difference uh, in damping forces as generated by the low speed adjuster. Basically what we see, redrawn here, is the effect that the, the difference in uh, opening the low speed from fully open, fully closed, with the high speed fully closed, uh, the difference that that can make, the difference that opening or fully closing the low speed rebound can make when the high speed rebound is fully open, set to minimum, uh, and the effect that we see at low speeds before the, uh, the high speed adjuster has really had any effect whatsoever. Now, the interesting thing to note really is that even at high speeds, the low speed adjuster is actually dominant if the adjuster is wound in far enough. Where this becomes interesting is the way that it allows us to simplify setup. And what do I mean by that? Now we can see that with the high speed rebound set to maximum, we have a range of about 100%. So maximum uh, damping at 0.5 meters a second, 500 millimeters a second, which translates to about 1.2 meters a second, 1.3 meters a second at the rear wheel, which is fairly close to realistic peak velocities in rebound. Um, the difference here is that with the high speed rebound wound fully in, we can then use the low speed adjuster within a very large range of adjustment uh, as our primary adjuster. If we wind the high speed rebound right out, then the low speed starts having less effect. Then the high speed adjuster becomes the primary adjuster. Now, how far in does the high speed adjuster really start to give the low speed adjuster any meaningful range. The way that I prefer to go about setting up these types of dampers, especially on downhill bikes or you know descent oriented bikes, uh, which most which is what most of these dampers are found on, whether it be a downhill bike, you know, an enduro race bike, long travel trail bike, whatever you call it. Um, if you have a high speed rebound adjuster, chances are your bike is fairly heavily oriented towards descending. My preference is to set the high speed rebound to maximum, then work with your low speed adjuster only, in the same way that you would if you had only one adjuster. What is the main reason for doing this? One thing, it reduces the number of variables. Now this is really critical when it comes to getting set up uh, optimized for yourself. Now I hate the word optimized because nothing is ever optimized, it's you know, your best guess at the possible trade-offs. What works best for you? By eliminating one of those variables, you make it much easier to use your low speed adjuster to zero in on the rebound speed that works the best for you. Now, the truth is, there is a considerable overlap here. By eliminating that, that variable, the uh, other adjustment uh, in the form of the high speed rebound adjuster, by essentially eliminating that as a variable, we make things much simpler because we then just have one range of rebound to essentially scroll through. You can do it click by click. Then it becomes quite simple. There shouldn't necessarily have to be, in my opinion, with the way that rebound adjusters are currently configured, there shouldn't have to be um, the same interplay that there is uh, with high speed compression and uh, low speed compression because we don't have the same variety of inputs. Right? We only have a spring that's pushing back against us. So by Winding the high speed all the way in to the firmest, slowest position. That's all the way clockwise on any of the adjusters. Don't push it too far on the DHX2s or the Float X2s. Very easy to break the adjuster by doing that. 
winding that all the way into maximum then means that we can realistically most of the time use the low speed adjuster on its own. When do we then wind the high speed to something that isn't maximum? Well, when we can't get the rebound fast enough just using the low speed. So if you get to the point where your low speed rebound is set to minimum, then by opening up the high speed rebound adjuster one or two clicks at a time, then we start to shift these two curves here to be closer to these two. What that means is that this minimum level uh, of rebound damping available, you know, with this set to minimum, um, this range gets shifted to lower and lower damping forces. When you get to the point where you have both adjusters fully open and you can't, uh, and you can't go any faster, then you're at the limit of the shocks adjustment. Other changes need to be made. We're not going to discuss that right now. But that is, in my opinion, the most effective way to adjust your low speed and high speed rebound. What becomes, what becomes quite evident here as well, when we look at uh, a plot of velocity versus travel, now what we see, and those of you who have watched previous episodes of the Tuesday Tune will see, uh, when we draw something in compression, you get some kind of curve like that, where your peak velocities happen very early in the travel. The rebound is kind of the opposite. Obviously, the rebound, uh, the compression velocities are far, far higher absolute velocities than the rebound values are, so this is obviously not drawn to scale. But what we'll typically see is a peak rebound value of somewhere around half a meter a second. It can be higher, it can be lower, uh, depending on your setup, depending on your bike, the leverage ratio, and so forth. But using that as a reference point, we then look at like where we start seeing digression in the curves um, from the high speed adjuster. And where we're seeing it is at really, really low velocities. So we're seeing that if you were to try to isolate the low speed adjuster's effect uh, and the high speed adjuster's effect and say, okay, well, you know, the rebound adjuster, the high speed rebound adjuster affects everything beyond here. So everything in there is affected by the high speed rebound adjuster. That would be true. What you'd also find is that low speed adjuster affects it substantially, as we can see here, because the difference in your damping levels with the same high speed rebound setting at, at these peak velocities is really substantial when we're only changing the low speed. Now, I realize this is going to take a lot of people a couple of watches to really get their head around, but it is relatively simple. The low speed adjuster makes a huge amount of difference when the high speed adjuster is wound all the way in, and it makes only a small amount of difference at high speeds with the high speed rebound adjuster wound all the way open, so all the way fast. The velocities at which the high speed circuit is able to open up uh, when it's wound fully on or you know partly on, these velocities are actually quite small. So as a result, both of the adjusters end up having a huge amount of overlap in their effect. So to summarize, my suggestion for setting these up is as follows. Set your high speed rebound to fully slow. Please don't push past the stop on the adjuster. Tune using the low speed rebound adjuster. Open the high speed rebound adjuster only if you can't get it fast enough with the low speed adjuster. Beyond that, it's the same as any other rebound adjuster. Now this tuning methodology is applicable to Fox's X2 shocks, the coil DHX2 and the air float X2. Uh, it's applicable to everything that Cane Creek make. It is applicable to the Vivids if you have one. The Vivids in particular definitely, definitely follow that. Crank the high speed, you have more than enough range from the low speed. Hopefully there's something interesting and or informative in there and uh, we will see you again next week.